Good afternoon. We just wanted to welcome you to Breathe Easy. Enjoy yourself. Good days, bad days. We're here at Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System. I'm Bob Sipkowiak from Breathe Strong and Respiratory Therapy at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. Radhika Valescu is our nurse practitioner co-host, and we have a special guest, Larry Pellerito, who is a manufacturer of oxygen supplies to help us today with our special topic. And just like we were talking about last month, we talked about pulmonary rehab, and we introduced you to a patient advocate named Joe Von Tucker. We're going to draw some of Joe Von Tucker's comments in her book, um, the, uh, the 52 Weeks and Breathing Healthy with COPD by Jane Martin, that uh, encourage you, if you want to get more information on this topic, is on the COPD Foundation website. But we want to welcome you to Sarasota Memorial today. Happy Volunteer uh, on Tuesday. It's not Volunteer Day. It's Valentine's Day. Uh, my wife will remind me. Okay. Um, our destination points today are three. We're going to basically talk about. Excuse me. We're going to be talking about enjoying the good days and how to manage the bad days with COPD. We're also going to be talking about panic and anxiety in COPD, which are very common. Uh, challenges sometimes in living with COPD or other uh, life-threatening pulmonary conditions that can make it difficult. And our guest, uh, Larry, is going to help us with what to do with oxygen and anxiety and, and talk about those issues. With that in mind, we're going to Welcome, Radhika, who's going to talk about good days and bad days. Thank you, Bob, and welcome, Mary, to our support group. Well, having all of us, we have good days and not so good days, and so uh, called bad days. When uh, having COPD, this is quite a challenge, and the bad days, uh, we know they may have a different meaning. Uh, the, pa the patients told me that they know that they're going to have a so-called bad day because early morning when they wake up, their first sign that the day is not going to go as it should go, it's not going to be a normal day, is the fact that their breathing is worse. They have worsening of shortness of breath. Um, also, they complained about being more fatigued and having aches and pains. What, what happens is um, during those bad days when their energy is low, when uh, their dyspnea gets worse, um, they always ask, what should I do? Um, what is it for me to do? Well, everybody cycles through symptoms and emotions differently, there are some commonalities. What, what do you have to do? You have to ask yourself and check if you have a sign, signs of a, an early infection. We know that suffering with COPD prones everybody to infections more than the, the, the average population. Also, you have to, to see if those symptoms are due just to the change in, uh, of what more gassy foods lately. Your doctor probably prescribed some rescue medications. Those medications that you're supposed to take is needed every three to four hours or every two hours. Those are the days when you should use those uh, nebulizers and inhalers. So reach out to those um, medications, to the, those meds. Um, also, very importantly, rest. Take care of yourself. Take extra care of yourself in those days. When you suffer with you know that those days are coming and going, like for all of us. But it's an extra care um, approach that you have So pamper yourself those days. Rest more. Watch your favorite movie. Watch your favorite show. Um, if you have to do some activity uh, around the house, just take frequent breaks. Rest <coughs> frequently. And limit those activities to something that requires more sitting or laying down. 
and reserve the other activities for those days when you really feel good. Now, after a bad day, that bad day is not going to be uh, lasting forever, you may have a better day. I would call those days the recovery days. They're not the normal days, they're not the good days. So on a recovery day, do the same thing as you did the day before. Rest, recover, enjoy those moments. We know that COPD can be isolated, but all of you all have uh, hopefully families, friends around. So when you, when you have those down days, please kindly advise them that you don't have a good day and ask them to understand that. And I would say, maybe tell them exactly if there is need for help and exactly how can they help you. And this way we avoid frustrations and uh, everybody everybody uh, feels useful and um, uh, you, you feel also uh, empowered and at ease knowing that everybody understands your condition. During the good days, we know everybody knows what to do or they enjoy their favorite activities. foods, the right exercise, having the right number of exercises, and um, for those not so good days. They will come again. This is the cycle, and this is the, one of the characteristics of COPD. Let's prepare. I had a bad day yesterday, but today I'm Summer we had respiratory therapists. You know, Bob, maybe you should have stayed back home today. Would you kind of speak to that in terms of maybe the need to postpone when you're in that recovery? That's a great question. As I said, after a bad day or one or two bad days so called, you have those recovery days. I call them recovery days. Not good days, recovery days. And I agree that on that recovery day, you have to give yourself some extra time, some extra care. When you and go outside or go and enjoy a more strenuous activity when you really feel good. Don't think that feeling better Better doesn't feel good. When you feel good, that will be the day, as advised by the hospital therapist in rehab, you should go there and uh, I guess one other thing I wanted to mention now is that if I'm looking at a good day and a bad day, there's these issues called panic and anxiety. And I'd like to address a couple of those issues. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to, to relate to is that panic and anxiety is something that everybody's different in terms of how they experience it. And I'd like to refer to some comments from patients that you see on the screen here. Julia said, I must be having some sort of breakdown as I'm constantly sad, worried, and live in fear each and every day. John said, I think my panic attacks result from not getting enough oxygen in my system. Marcus Aurelius had a, a, a comment about this. The first rule is to keep an untroubled spirit. The second rule is to look things in the face and know them for what they are. A lot of times we get overwhelmed. COPD it uh, has uh, some common characteristics, panic and anxiety is among them, okay? It, it's not strange, okay? It's estimated that about 47% pe of people with COPD experience anxiety and panic. You're not alone. And I, I think your point earlier about not feeling isolated is really important to keep in mind. You're not experiencing this alone. Other people are experiencing this well. Another point I, I want to make in terms of a, a patient's reference is Don. Don had an interesting uh, comment. My heart races. I get sweaty and short of breath. 
when I move around. I'm on oxygen when I'm doing things. Could it be a combination of all the meds I take? I try to stay calm and use the PLB or purse breathing. Sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't. What else can I do? Now Rodney, another patient, said my O2 sats or oxygen saturation go up and down. I am now on O2 at bedtime and lately when I'm out of bed and I'm about to get getting up in the middle of the night with panicky feelings and have a hard time trying to fall asleep. Is there anything I can do to lessen these feelings? I'd like to throw those couple questions out and play with them a little bit. Okay? Um, let's take um, the fact that COPD has many faces. There are challenges, doubts, fears, and hopes we all share. John may have a tendency to be more anxious than Don. Julia may have an anxiety disorder before ever having been diagnosed with COPD. Don might have more concerns than 12, 14 million people with COPD in the United States, and everybody has their own story and their own journey, and they may be experiencing it differently. COPD, with or without anxiety or depression, may affect family relationships and participation in social life. Can, and it can even lead to isolation, like we addressed earlier, uh, on good days and bad days, this panic and anxiety can have an overlay of that isolation from partner, family, and losing interest in relating to one another. However, there is help and hope, and that's important. Um, you're not us. And there are things we can do, and that's what we're going to address today. All the things that the patients talked about doing, you need to continue doing. But at the same time, not, not feel like there's not going to be a tomorrow. I think your point was excellent, Radhika, about the recovery day. That it's great, you're taking care of yourself. However, don't overdo it on recovery. Hang in there and take it one step at a time. Um, some tips to help with panic and anxiety. You want to make sure there's thorough testing for lung and heart function. Make sure that's evaluated. Uh, one of the things here at Sarasota Memorial, uh, we have a lung health clinic. I can't get into my doctor. It's season, okay? Appointments are stacked up, perhaps. It's not just here in Sarasota, Florida. Around Florida and around the country this time of year with this flu season, there are many delays in access to the health care you may need. Well, here at Sarasota, in our area, we have a lung health clinic. And it is basically a team approach to help make sure you have that support to get these things evaluated. Um, you also, when you and your health care provider have identified your physical cause of dis and discomfort, You've taken steps to regain your health. You may need an assessment for anxiety and learn coping skills. Discuss with your provider to be honest in how you feel. I'd like to throw that back to the deeper for a second. Can you address that a little bit in terms of you've evaluated, but hey, what do I do on the next step if I need an assessment? Absolutely. Um, if any need for extra assessment or um, questions, please reach out to your health care provider. I can't emphasize enough. That could be a physician, your nurse practitioner. Uh, here at the Lung Health Clinic, is, uh, is us, uh, me, and Bob, and Dr. Seaman. We're more than happy to evaluate and to go further into details so we can help you thoroughly recover and be in charge of your condition. It is very important to be in charge of your condition and not to be isolated. There is a COPD community. You can reach out to and be part of it. There's so many others, just reading the statistics, so many other uh, patients suffering with COPD, they are more than happy to join you and listen to your story and learn from your story and then they will learn from your stories again. So don't be isolated. Reach out to your healthcare provider. Reach out to your COPD community. And, and I'm going to piggyback off your thought there for a second. I'm going to jump into Larry's topic a little bit, but I, I know he'll forgive me. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that, that on that opportunity to reach out, if you're already in pulmonary rehab, for instance, and your oxygen needs need a double check in terms of how I'm doing with my portable system, you might reach out to your pulmonary rehab therapist and say, can you help check me out 
on how I'm doing with my portable oxygen system. Just another way to reach out. Always bring it with you. Yeah. Good point. Just, <laughs> that's a great exactly point. what you're exactly going to be using uh, yep. when you're out and about. That's a great point. Because you never know where the level is on that rehab day. Exactly. A good day, mild day. Get checked. They've yep. got all the instruments there. They can thoroughly check you at that point. Yep. Down the home stretch on chips. We got a couple more for you. Uh, we want to make sure your bags. Techniques such as per slip breathing. Uh, your respiratory therapist will be able to teach you these techniques to manage and control anxiety. Uh, no. If you use supplemental oxygen and or have a finger pulse oximeter, this device can help you evaluate the need and benefit of the breathing techniques. Um, to confirm, ah, my breathing's helping me. I see it on the end of my finger. Uh, number four, physical and mental relaxation can be a powerful tool for dealing with breathlessness and anxiety. Learn relaxation techniques, relax tense muscles, panicky thoughts, and an anxious mind. And lastly, ask your provider if you should talk to a counselor or other mental health specialist. It is not a sign of weakness to talk to someone with, with, uh, about these issues about your health, happiness, and well-being. Key points on pain, panic anxiety, normal feelings of panic anxiety with COPD, it's normal. It's not rare. 47% of the people ever have this issue. Reactions, excuse me, reactions to feelings of panic and anxiety differ from person to person, from Julia to John to Don to Rodney. Okay. Third, make sure you and your provider have ruled out other physical causes, such as heart disease, which can also cause panic and anxiety. Learn correct breathing techniques and always Remember that the key is, is uh, with breathlessness is oxygen, as we saw with some of these out outcomes. Which leads me to welcome our guest speaker. I'm pleased to introduce Larry Colorito, founder and program coordinator of OxyMed Respiratory, who and a very strong supporter that help us understand some of these oxygen devices as we uh, reach out on a bad day. Larry. You want to mention a little bit about Breeze Strong at this point? Put that up on the screen. That's a good point. Good. Who is Breeze Strong? Okay. Well, basically, Breeze Strong is our coalition here in Florida of providers, uh, hospitals, uh, industry sponsors, pulmonary rehab, doctors, respiratory therapy organizations, all of us working together with patient organizations such as the American Lung Association, COPD Foundation and your local support groups. So we're all working together. And we've been in existence for about two years, uh, after five years as known as the Florida COPD Coalition. But we changed two years ago when we realized we need to partner more with industry sponsors so that we could truly uh, fulfill our, our, our goal of serving and, and honoring the legacy of the champions that started the COPD Foundation a number of years ago, uh, John Walsh, uh, and here in Florida, a champion advocate, Nick Jones, in the villages. Uh, but we've also, now on this journey, seen a lot more champion patients that we want to honor. The state. Uh, we have seven regions in the state, and we're developing. There's three, three things, basically, we want to do. We want to connect engage and empower. And that connecting patient to patient, patient to provider, provider to provider is so important. Education. For each healthcare system in the state. What we're doing here connect with social media so that we have three ways now here at Sarasota Memorial Facebook, 
on a monthly and ongoing basis. Uh, COPD Navigator on YouTube, uh, weekly from Michigan, and on, ongoing with archives. And now I'm pleased to announce a third partner on our social media, on on-demand system, Ultimate Pulmonary Wellness on Facebook. So when we're trying to make sure that we allow as many opportunities and develop as many opportunities to really empower patients through relating to providers and one another. Can you bring up the point of your COPD and now you're admitted to the hospital and then all of a sudden I was a, a, a care transitions coach uh, for three years and I did a lot of education with patients who got that message for the first time and many times it's overwhelming from two standpoints number one why why me what is this uh, what is COPD so it starts with an understanding of the condition and overwhelming feeling but then if I need oxygen and it's the first time how do I go about this and what do I need and how do I make sure I'm getting what I need? It's pretty daunting, initially, especially. Uh, I'm dealing with that in the Lung Health Clinic every day. Uh, and Lung Health Clinic, pulmonary rehab tries to do, our pulmonologists and uh, primary care physicians are, are doing, so we can help bridge that understanding. Make it massive overwhelming. So, all of a sudden, you're delivered a piece of oxygen equipment to be discharged. Mm -hmm. And where does that come from? How does that all of a sudden show up at the hospital? Usually, each hospital will have a, a durable medical equipment company that they'll call upon to deliver that. suggested you know, there are three choices, four choices at that point? Well, again, back to the condition. Mm -hmm. The patient's pretty overwhelmed at that point. Yep. And many times, the reality is in a discharge process, there already may be by insurance uh, that direction of which which company to call. Yeah. And the doctor has an input too. As well, yeah. So it's a combination of insurance, the doctor, and the need. And chances are the doctor actually uh, is familiar with that. Make a choice for you. Uh, can we go to the next one? And you're going to get a tank on wheels, you're going to be discharged. You may be able to get uh, a smaller device when you're discharged. Uh, a little bit larger tank with this with a regulator on top which will be set at the hospital for your your journey home when you arrive home you're going to start using a home oxygen concentrate which we have up on the screen basically the standard bearers uh, in, in the marketplace uh, you will you're going to have the blue one a beige one or a black one and they have different brand names but are going to be able to uh, give you oxygen are discharged at a minimum of two liters for one reason that there's a standard in the insurance business in Medicare says to be able to prevent It's not one liter, it's two liters. Whether you need more or less, that's going to be determined. For liters, but in. There's a tendency to, let's read the oxygen needs as low as possible. For instance, So I'll have minimal need when I get home. Without realizing that that one liter might be a barrier.
Discharge from a hospital, usually they've done some type of night study. They determine that you need a certain level of the hospital the doctor recommends, or whatever setting it is. So that little thing on your finger that you're wearing the last four days in the hospital, that's registering uh, what's happening at discharge. you possibly not on oxygen? Well, one of, the, one of the things we usually see is a, a cop medications and treatments uh, to get the patient to the lowest minimal need to take care of themselves at home, whether it be a nebulizer or any others. Many times, uh, and what we've seen many times is that first time need for oxygen may encompass both a need with activity and its minute walk or uh, whatever. So they're giving always in liters. Correct. And that's Now, these machines is very comparable to the oxygen to come out of the wall outlet in a hospital. So they have to deliver a certain amount of oxygen, uh, a certain percentage of oxygen. Uh, it should be above 90% pure oxygen. And you have to get an FDA approval to even to have these products on the market. Let me clarify if I understand that. Yeah. When you say 90%, you're saying 90% purity coming out of the machine. Correct. Okay. Thank and you. They'll fluctuate anywhere from 95 to 96%. Uh, depends, again, uh, the atmosphere, what's going on with the machine. But they'll all alarm in the neighborhood of that. It's close to what they had at the hospital. Right. Okay. So someone's not always, well, in the hospital, they always know they're delivering 99% you know, oxygen right out of the wall. ...level, especially while you're sleeping. Well, basically, at night, have less lung function. Now you also, in this, we see a lot of this. Do, do you see But they'll bleed. It happened with in the small. So, in that 30 to 40 pounds, uh, you may be able to put them in the trunk of your car, but uh, pretty difficult to travel on a plane with them. So that's why these other two machines uh, are available. Sure. All right, so we're going to go over this part of it. So, again, we went over that there's uh, three different size machines. You have your larger machines, uh, which deliver a continuous flow up to five liters. The cost on that machine uh, for your home is going to be about $40 a month. 
and you may be able to get uh, some type of rate from your electrical company. Provide uh, your electrical company you'll be able to uh, lower that uh, that amount down. Also, you may be able to, uh, and you'll be able to possibly deduct it from your income tax too, because. I would like to address that, that cost. It looks like what we're seeing on the screen is that the bigger the machine, the more the cost. So right. about 30 pounds is $40 a month, right. 18, $18 a month, and nine, $12 a month. Correct. The reason why I mention that is that that could also be, if it's a large unit, a financial concern. And one thing, gets back to the connecting providers and community. Uh, you may have a situation we did in Lee County, I'm not sure here in Sarasota County, a, a program with identifying people with COPD and oxygen needs that might qualify for discount programs or something with an electric yes. company to make that financial hardship easier. Don't be I shy. I want to mention yeah. that because yeah. that's a reality that many of our patients may be dealing with, especially if they don't have insurance. Yes. So we went over there's uh, number two, you know, the purity. Uh, how these machines del deliver oxygen is that there are, in every machine, there are going to be two containers like this. And it's called molecular sieve. To me, it looks like kitty litter. I thought it was kitty litter. <laughs> Don't put it. It was created from. I do believe. And they discovered what was coming out was oxygen, a higher grade of oxygen. So someone picked up the patent on, in the medical industry and said, well, why are we delivering these large H cylinders that you use to cut steel with and cascade together? Why don't we develop a machine, use a compressor, pump air through it, back and forth, and the purity is a higher grade of oxygen. Wow, I didn't realize that history. Why that is is because this molecule here wants to absorb the nitrogen and it lets the purity of oxygen go through. It puts it in a holding tank and it's a small holding tank. Not enough to catch on fire but we want you to be careful there because you're going to have your oxygen tubing coming out of an outlet like so in the, in the larger ones. And the one thing you don't want to do, and we're going to get into that, but let's before we get into what not to do with oxygen, Let's talk about you need a humidifier bottle. Now, in a hospital setting, they're going to put a humidifier bottle because they're not sure what setting you're going to be on. They could have you on two one day, three the next day, four the next day. So it's standard to use a humidifier bottle. At home, water because you don't want a calcium buildup. Is that distilled water there? Usually distilled water or highly cured water because the calcium will put an obstruction. In two liters, you'll be getting one liter. And most too tight, too loose, you get a leak. It looks like you're getting your oxygen. What you're actually getting to your nose could be one liter. Some people will take that cannula out of their nose, they'll put it up to their eyes, they'll put it in their ears. Do yourself bubbling in that glass of water, which we show on number three should equal the amount of bubbling in a humidifier. Try it without it. You'll, it'll adjust. You might have to move the tubing around because the cannulas are tipped.
and they're going up against your skin. Well, they're going to form a little crack there. And that's where you're going to get your dryness or bleeding. You can flip the cannula around if you want to disperse the air in a different direction. And one thing I found, I had an opportunity to work in home care. And one of the things I've also found is that people who are on two meters continuously all the time, there are what they call soft nasal cannulas. They have softer cushions yes. to make it more comfortable yes. and less irritating. And especially softness around here so it's not right. uh, leaving marks right. or uh, a rash. You know, so letting careful. your provider know is important. Yes. I need something to help you with that. Most of them are putting out soft cannulas now. Good. So the danger of oxygen is this. And I've had many patients I've worn. They want to light their cigarette. One, don't smoke with your own oxygen. But I had about four people that are determined to smoke while they had the cannula in their nose. And I kept on warning them. And I think all four of them eventually burnt their nose. Because the cigarette's this far away and you have an open flame. Not that the cigarette is going to create a flame. But that match at that point. So do not smoke with oxygen. Because do not the, smoke at all. Do not smoke at all, but do not smoke with oxygen. That's very important. Secondly, do not have candles around with oxygen. I had one lady that uh, her machine was 50 feet, 50 feet, maybe even longer. And she decided to light a candle at this point here. And sit. it burned through the tubing. And it wasn't connected to an oxygen concentrator, which has a shutoff valve. It was connected to liquid oxygen. It happened to be all the way in the other side of the house. And she didn't know her house was on fire until the neighbors walked in. So be careful of oxygen. And if you have a bottle, Obviously, this is going to give you continuous flow oxygen. So, watch out for flames. Uh, cooking on an open flame, uh, not wise. Electric stove is okay if you're in the kitchen. Uh, don't stay away from cooking because we need you need your help along with oxygen. Well, another point that the deacon referred to about the smoking, not smoking at all. The same thing with the open flame, we're seeing a lot more lung conditions because of that open flame cooking around the world, especially for the world countries. Yeah. So the next slide is going to start, we're going to start talking about portable oxygen. And what happens here is that you have three choices. So when that home care company delivers oxygen, they're going to standard give you a home oxygen concentrator, which was on the other slide, and then they're going to show up with probably half a dozen of these cylinders here. Or a big one. Or a large one on a cart. Because you may only need uh, oxygen at night, and uh, they're going to give you a large one to determine whether how active you are. The doctor may not prescribe oxygen during the day, only at night. It's going to be an emergency backup tank. Give you continuous flow. There's usually about four or five hours in this large tank. Or they're going to give you a handful of these small tanks because the doctor recommended portable oxygen so you can do your chores and not stay home. Now, there's going to be two regulators on top. And that screen at the top there, the right-hand side there, that has a regulator on it which gives you oxygen every time you inhale. It's called a conserving device. What it's doing is it's conserving the amount of oxygen it's delivering. So it's, it's not continuous, continuous flow then. It's not continuous flow. If you were to put a continuous flow on this size tank at two liters, you would have less than an hour's worth. A little bit larger tank, maybe an hour and 15. So on that size tank there, they're able to make the tank smaller and determine the oxygen level at that point that you need to stay out four or five hours. Always take a second tank with you. Now, what number do you put it on? 
when you're discharged from the hospital, the doctors or the doctors already say two liters continuous flow. But this device is not putting out continuous flow. It's putting out pulse flow. So it's giving you oxygen every time you inhale. So it's important to have the cannula in your nose correctly. If it's away from your nose, it's not going to pulse. What if I'm a mouth breather? Well, that's where you're going to learn to breathe properly. A COPD patient should learn and pay you know, special instructions with their respiratory therapist at the hospital. That should be instructed at the hospital. The bed. The bed air. So do that, but during the day, you're aware of this. If you're a mouth breather, you can check that. You can also check it with a fingertip pulse oximeter. And when you're active, what number do you want to stay at? Well, I would think you want to stay about 90%. 90%. So you determine the number you want to put this regulator on, this pulse flow regulator is determined by your fingertip. Because it's not continuous flow, that's what the home oxygen concentrators do. Continue. One. Two, when you're slightly more active. Three, walking up a flight of stairs. Walking around the mall. You might even have to put it as high as four. And they're adjustable to that. Now, some of these regulators have another point to them where you can actually flip them to continuous flow. They have a two-liter continuous flow. So the conserving device may have that feature. May have that feature. Some of them have two-liter continuous flow as a safety. Some of them have two, three, and four that you can go to for that emergency situation that you may need even more oxygen. And again, you're going to feel it, but you want to see it. There's a hero in the state of Florida, Nick Jones. He used to have a saying. The word titrate to match, he said, I will titrate to saturate to that 90% all the time. And that's really important principle for patients. I may be in trouble. And that might help me guide when I need that continuous flow option versus a pulse option. So titrate to saturate to migrate. Well, another hero of mine, Dr. Thomas Petty, uh, who was the inventor of long-term oxygen and pulmonary rehab. He was a hunter fisherman out west, and he'd say, because he'd always test out the oxygen equipment in the mountains, fishing and hunting, and he'd say, "I will titrate to migrate." So, Which titrate to migrate, titrate to saturate. Active. Active. You need to migrate. The circulation <laughs> has to be there. So we're going to take it to the next level of the middle one here, which is called uh, Helios, and that's liquid oxygen system. It used to be the gold standard in the marketplace. Used to be. Used to be the gold standard. No longer. It's still the gold standard. Okay, fill me in. What happened? All right. What happened was is that the cost of oxygen, the cost of delivering oxygen for a liquid system, and you had to deliver it every two weeks, obviously with the gas. Right to order any three of these systems from your home care dealer. Medicare says that they pay for a portable oxygen system. They don't say what kind of portable oxygen system. Medicare insurance companies say portable oxygen system. Now we talked about the home stationary system. That's standard. You have to get that first before you to get a portable system. I can't go right to a portable system. No. Okay. Under one condition that you brought that up. If a home care dealer would like to deliver a combination product, which is battery operated, 
and delivers continuous flow, then you'll be able to go to that directly. And this device also will do the same. They'll deliver, this is your home oxygen concentrator because it delivers two liters of continuous flow. And it's battery operated, so you can go out and about and you can plug it into your car. Both of these you'll be able to do that, plug it into your car. Because this delivers two liters continuous flow, this delivers three liters continuous flow, but they're also battery operated. So able to take them on a plane, travel, and do those types of do they deliver pulse as well as continuous? So the other side of this product is what they're trying to do is no different than the tank, trying to deliver to conserve oxygen, they're trying to conserve battery time. So this machine on two liters continuous flow, you'll get two and a half hours. This machine on two liters continuous flow, you'll get 45 minutes. So you're not going to be on continuous flow on a portable oxygen concentrator. You will be on pulse flow. And you're going to determine the number you want on either of the machines using a fingertip pulse oximeter. And it could range anywhere from two to up to, this one goes to six pulse, this one goes up to nine settings of pulse. So you're going to determine that with your fingertip oximeter. Again, you're trying to conserve that. But back to liquid, uh, I like liquid. Liquid is a great product. Uh, it's higher grade oxygen. You're going to, uh, that product there, you can actually put in a fanny pack and it'll give you the proper amount of oxygen uh, while you're active. And you have a liquid-based system at home, which uh, does not use any electricity. You can get a two liters of continuous out of that. Now, can you get that product? Chances are you probably won't because the home care dealers uh, have cut back on that product because of the cost of that. So if you have liquid, I'm just mentioning that now, keep it. Don't let anyone take it away from you. Supplement with one of these if you're traveling, but try to keep your liquid system. So moving from there, we're going to talk about the smaller devices. And what they do is they also have these products in there. One's on the right side, one's on the left side. On all these products, it's basically designed the same one. And there are two types of products. Could you go? Yeah, no, that's still up there. Oops, sorry. That one, yeah. So, there are two types of oxygen concentrate, portable oxygen concentrate. You have your cart type ones. It's going to weigh about uh, the small one here. It's going to be in that 10 pound range. You're going to have this one in the 14 pound range, and you'll have this one in the 5 pound range, and they even make them smaller, which is in the 3 pound range. Which one is right for you? Right. The answer is? At the end of my finger. It's always at the end of the finger, because you have to determine the most important thing, is to keep the saturation level at a certain point, so you can keep up with your activity. And that's the other part of that, right, Larry, is that it's at the end of the finger with the activity. And that's Correct. why earlier when we were talking about that pulmonary rehab therapist being able to assess it with my home unit, that's so valuable. With all these products, even with the tanks, you have And then move to the next level. Well, I'm just thinking as a former pulmonary rehab person, that's a great time. When I'm exercising the person on pulmonary rehab to evaluate, am I keeping up with my portable system? Yeah. Whether it's a tank or a portable. Right. If you go to the next slide, I appreciate it. So, I think we quickly went over in the last slide, you know, the liquid, uh, the bottles that they're going to deliver, or the battery systems. Uh, they're going to be in uh, two different ways, and we, can, we consider in our business, the portable oxygen systems that do not give continuous flow is your daytime oxygen. That's the oxygen you would use during the day that you can assess yourself. For one reason, you wouldn't sleep with this tank on a conserving device in pulse flow mode while sleeping. Because will it trigger? Will it be giving you enough oxygen? You're at 14, 15 breaths per minute while you're sleeping. When you're awake, you're at 18, 20, 22 breaths. It depends on your activity. 
but you're able to assess yourself while you're awake, but not while you're sleeping. That's why you have to be very careful. So these products will give you these again back to So that's why it's slide here. one there you see the other machines are day and night. So you can use these either day and night, these other machines. And that'd be the number two. Uh, that would be the number two. So you get those, so it would be uh, so there's two types of pulse flow machines, you know, continuous and pulse flow oh, and combination. Okay. And we go back to, you know, what leader flow uh, is best for me. Uh, leaders are, you know, continuous flow is always leaders. Pulse flow is based on milliliters. Are they equal to each other? Never. Another term for that milliliters I, I like to use sometimes to help the patient understand the difference is it might be considered a burst. Could you hear that burst yes. when it's pulsed? Or a bolus about a bolus. Uh, that it's not a continuous, it's either a milliliters, burst, or a bolus. Right. But that, it, it varies in size, but it's that burst of oxygen. And the conserving device on a tank is going to give you a burst. The conserving device on these products here will not give you a burst. It's very subtle because it's an electronic device. Right. Now, the difference between the tank conserving device, which is usually two diaphragms, I just call them a scuba diving regulator, because that's basically what they are. They have a diaphragm to let the amount of oxygen to you, and they have another diaphragm that senses your inhalation. So they will give a larger burst, and they're not as sensitive as these products. These products happen to have the sensor that's in a ventilator in a hospital. They're that sensitive. The FDA demands that sensitivity on these have to match that. So electronically, they will anticipate your breath rate. They will deliver oxygen in the first millisecond, right up front, so you can get as much oxygen as possible. Because the respiratory cycle is usually about three seconds. You breathe about 20 breaths per minute, and at two liters continuous flow, in two seconds, because you have to go through the respiratory cycle. You're going to have to get the bad air out, as well as get the good air in. you got to get the bad air out. Okay. So now you're at... It's about 670 milliliters. Okay. It's one third of that. The rest is being wasted. It's blowing continuously, but not in these devices. The storage on tank on this device is very small, just enough for that one breath of air. And then it generates more oxygen, puts it in that tank, and delivers more the next breath. So it's important to know that. You could go to the next one. You're using this product, or these small portable ones you can carry over your shoulder, or are you using the tank? The answer is always at the end of the finger, not on the screen. You have to determine that to stay above that 90% threshold, unless the doctor changes it to the 89%. Very common now, unlike. On 200, 250 dollars. Now you can get them less than in 20. All the drugs are down. Are they are comparable to uh, a, a, an oximeter in a hospital or the ones at your doctor's office? No. All the, the ones in the hospital. You'll have to be patient with it. You are getting the right amount of blood flow. Cold hands, do not expect to get a good reading.
Throw up your hand. Clap your hands. If you get that stimulation into your finger, then take your oximetry reading. So now we're going to go to the next slide, which is having all of them on the table here and give you kind of a they're not like a home oxygen concentrator. Home oxygen concentrator deliver control. this product here, you're going to get one liter out of it. Does it deliver more oxygen when you inhale? Some of them do. This product here will give you three of these on continuous flow because they have continuous, the ability to give continuous flow. So you need to determine what product it's going to be best for you. And where do you find that out? Your home care dealer has all these products available to him. He has the oxygen tanks available to him. So you need to ask, will this be a better product for me? Because it weighs three pounds. It's not the weight that we're interested in. Put that other one back up on the screen, the end of your finger. Nice and small. Or this. How are you determine if this is the right one? One that they'll deliver through insurance. Area that's the uh, five A line. Right. You have up to five pulse flows, and you have the care comfort, the indigent, and This one here is Zeno, GC, GC Zeno, or the Phillips simply. The three liter continuous flow machine. For the precision of what my need is. Well, it's probably going to be three ways you're going to be evaluated. You, you have, you, a lot of people will cheat themselves in thinking, oh, I just want the smallest and lightest, as long as I have something. But at the end, level, a problem. throw something on here too because I saw this I saw her last night okay. no oxygen concentrator yet yeah. that I'm waiting for yes. Not tomorrow but they're asking, where's your portable oxygen?
was 92%. My point is that they There's two anxiety levels that you have. One, is the bottle going to run out? Well, what happens when you're underwater? You're always looking. I've scuba dived, and I'm looking back constantly at my dials. Time to get back. So to remove that anxiety with a bottle, bring an extra bottle. But you drain through the second bottle. So now you want to get a portable oxygen concentrator because you can plug it in your car and drive all around the state. And that's what my lady's concern was. I'm active. I want to travel. I want to get around. And I want her to stay active. But we need to work with our home care provider. Correct. And work through these issues. Fly with these products here. Why didn't you get it? Yep. Will Medicare for the stationary option? First, you have to be able to have. And that's when the battle goes. That's when the battle starts. And why I say a battle? Because nobody knows long. But if you're prescribed oxygen 24-7, then you know right away your need to get what you need to stay active. Because less activity, what happens to a patient? The saturation, the, 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 the whole, the whole lifestyle changes, and that's when you get that anxiety. And that's where you get that, oh, woe is me. So, this is a key factor. You can't go scuba diving without the air. You can't get out of your home without. The battle because you have to go back to the doctor and say, all right. I'm on oxygen, I give, I have tanks, but I can't drive as far as I want, I can't go and visit my friends as often as I want, I can't stay out as long as I want. I want a portable oxygen system. So the oxygen company that providing oxygen to you, and that's how we started the beginning of the discussion is, who determined that oxygen company? And It's, you're going to leave it to the professionals. But there's a standard policy with all of them. And all of them have to deliver a home oxygen concentrator. Some of them will upgrade you to a portable oxygen system. But they probably won't do that the first month. Because they don't know if you're going to go off oxygen or stay on oxygen. That's one thing that I was going to mention is that it's That evaluation needs to be done in, say, 90 days to see where you're at then. At that time, you're a long-term oxygen patient or you're going off. So the oxygen company picks up the equipment. They're not getting paid for that short period of time. So you go into the fourth month, and now you're a long-term oxygen patient. And now you're into three months of a 36-month contract, an unsigned contract. So we need a contract. Though. Well, a contract is usually between uh, two individuals. They sign off here, and they say, all right, we're going to just deliver this product to you at a determined price, and we're going to deliver these products. Well, that's what the home care dealers are doing with the Medicare insurance company. They agree to deliver this equipment. In the
they have to take care of you for 60 months. So for five years. So you're three months into your contract, but now you're really five months, five years, that you're with this oxygen company. Can you change oxygen companies? Yes. Will another oxygen company take you on as a customer? are going to get of this 36 months of payments. They're not going to get more than 36 months of payments. The last two years, they get a small amount of money. And that payment is around, per month, about $100 a month. So it's a lot $100, and now it's $100 a month. Well, at $200 a month, you got all the equipment you wanted. At $100 a month, then there's a cutback. And where is it going to be cut? Instead of just giving everyone one of these or one of these. As I understand it, back to the beginning of the oxygen, you have a situation where the portable is that E cylinder yes. and the concentrator, and that's it. Yes. That's the portable of the E cylinder. And the concentrator. So there's no incentive for, a, financially speaking, for a, a, a home medical equipment company to provide anything more than that easel. Because at that point, that's determined what they need, what you need. So then you get it reevaluated. So you get evaluated as quick as you possibly can after you discharge from the hospital. Get back to your doctor's office. And say, All right, can I get off this? Can I not get off this? How are my medications doing? Am I being you know, proactive here? Uh, and that's where that determination comes in. And now you have the opportunity to, now back to changing oxygen companies. That are uh, contract. To see what oxygen company is going to serve you best. too small because this is the rest of your life. Because for some reason won't take you on board because I mean, they're only going to Can you buy it from your home care dealer? You have to ask. Usually the guideline with Medicare is that they on the state regulations if directly from the manufacturer. Some manufacturers sell these products. You're not going to get local service on the product. The product that you purchase, well, what if you buy one of these? These progress, will the manufacturer or other companies let you trade these products in? Early on, the need of that option. So, you have to go to another brand uh, to more oxygen, so be aware of there. Is it going to alarm?
charging from the manufacturer because they only give it to that one <coughs> person. They're not going to transfer it to you. These batteries run almost uh, three to five hundred dollars. For this machine that you're getting from a neighbor. $900. So, should you go to an eBay? Or anyone about the product? The prescription for well, the sure. product. Sales that. in other countries coming into this country. The eBay, the Amazon auction site. I see online is a tendency In, uh, four hours, and you call someone and say, I'll on top. Well, four liters continuous flow. Were you analyzed? Four pulse, five pulse. Okay, I'm at ninety percent. All right. I'm Can I use this machine? Four liter continuous flow. Only pulse flow. Can I use this at night? It's delivering oxygen. Feature for sleep. You have to get a prescription from the doctor. Did you ever so, okay. But standard procedure is it's continuous flow. That that's what you were discharged out of the hospital. That's what the insurance companies are paying. And can you use this machine to replace every product? Can you replace your home oxygen machine and just use this product? Because you need a certain code number to do that. To the internet, and you're looking for a, a good product to buy. Always remember that the company. Go online and you buy it from somebody. State of Florida is not even going to recognize that company selling in your state.
to test the machine. Uh, you not out that money so you can return it or up this one I still need a portable concentrator without being charged So, uh, you have to make sure that this warranty, if you were to give this to a friend, or if you were to sell it on your own, that the warranty is going to be transferred. The manufacturer is going to honor the warranty when you sell it too. So, it creates the value. Like in our company, we'll buy back these machines. So you use it for two years, and you need a different machine. Around that you pay anywhere for two thousand to three thousand dollars for. Factors in there. So in the next slide. That's what we do. Okay. I want to thank you, Larry. We've got a little bit over, but I also want to just mention that we cover quite a bit here on Oxygen at the end. I want to give you my toll-free number for Bree Strong to clarify any questions. I have a toll-free number to help on that. Eight one six one. That's eight seven seven. At COPD Breathe Topic anyway. But I wanted to invite you, first of all, thank you, Larry, thank you, Radhika, for today's talk. I know we went a little bit over. Uh, it's our sort of memorial Facebook site. And next month, I just wanted to put you on the calendar. Remember, we're going to be talking.